Welcome everyone to our webinar, Creating a Foolproof Buying Plan. So this today's webinar is about clearly the buying plan. And, um, you know, we'd like to say that if your purchasing decisions are driven more by sentiment than by science, you're probably making some unnecessarily risky inventory investments. And that's why we're here today to hear from um, Jimmy Richberg and Adam Van Slyke from Fleet Feet. Um, those are our two experts today to walk us through the process of creating a foolproof buying plan. My name is Casey Higgs, and I will be your moderator for today's event. But without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce today's hosts. And as I said, we've got Jimmy Richberg, Director of Support here at RICS. And we're thrilled to have a RICS partner joining us today, Adam Van Slyke, um, who is the footwear retail planner at Fleet Feet Sports. Jimmy and Adam have actually worked together um, previously at Fleet Feet, so they've got a lot of great experience, both together on the team um, as well as individually. So I will leave it to you, Adam and Jimmy, to go ahead and introduce yourselves. Jimmy, I'll give you the floor first, my friend. Why, thank you. Uh, so my name is Jimmy Richberg, and as Casey said, I'm the Director of Support here at Rick Software. Um, I had the pleasure of working with Adam for several years on the footwear side of Fleet Feet. Um, I've been in retail for just about seven years now um, and focusing on the Rick side for the past three. Um, so I'm excited to kind of dive into this topic with everyone today. Um, and Adam, I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself as well. Thanks, Jimmy. Uh my name is Adam Van Slyke. I've been with uh, Fleet Feet now for about five years. Um, prior to uh, working for Fleet Feet, I was in the outdoor industry as a, a business owner and buyer, a couple other different capacities there. Uh, prior to that, uh, I was actually a school teacher. So that's uh, a couple lifetimes ago, but it was something I, I did enjoy. So I, I do enjoy the, the teaching aspect uh, of my job. And yeah, uh, Jimmy and I got to, to work together for a couple years. And uh, I'm excited to, uh, to be on this call. All right. Thanks, Adam. Um, so as Casey talked about in our intro here, we're going to be talking about the fundamentals of a buying strategy. And we've got a handful of topics that we're going to cover throughout this today. Um, and as we get started here, um, we're going to kind of dive into talking from some kind of like a high level perspective and then allowing Adam to talk about some real life application and how he thinks about these ideas. Um, so as we go into this topic of planning, you know, I can say that I, I've just returned from kind of two weeks of attending some retail conferences and I can say that uh, buying and planning uh, were kind of at the forefront of the education material that were, you know, being shown and being taught um, at these events um, because the buying and retail in general has changed so rapidly, especially over the last three to five years that it's become crucial that, you know, organizations focus on having their, you know, the retailers that they work with have a plan um, and be able to execute on that plan so that you know, everybody is, carrying the right product um, and, you know, they're meeting the goals that they have. So as we start to dive into this, we're going to start off with just thinking about it by having you no know, concrete plan um, and having an exit strategy. So the days uh, where you could kind of buy by feel and, you know, do whatever you thought was best have kind of passed. You know, as I said, retail is changing very rapidly. Um, and consumers are also getting a lot smarter with how they shop, um, with the amount of information they have at their fingertips. They know what they're looking for um, and know exactly where they can get it. So it's important that we're planning to meet the demand of our consumers and also meet the goals of our business. Um, so Adam, from your perspective, how have you seen kind of the way planning has changed over the last several years? And how do you approach it when you think about starting to create a plan for a particular buying season? I think uh, what you alluded to, Jimmy, is kind of the, the hang and hope method is, is definitely gone by the wayside. And I think that's the way a lot of buyers kind of plan their business. It's like, all right, we're just going to bring in something and, and see if it sells. And that was a buying plan at the time. Um, now it's much more thought out. Um, I always start with, with SMART goals. Um, and if you're familiar with that acronym, SMART, um, specific, measurable, attainable, um, you know, that, that acronym, having goals and having goals written down, not only for yourself as a buyer, but for the rest of your team, I think is really important. And that's a, a great place to start. 
Um, also, I think buying has changed because before I, I felt it was, you know, you had a buyer and, and that was a one man team or a two person uh, team of buying. But now you really need to loop in your social media person, your marketing person. If you do training programs in your store, uh, looping in that person on your, your plan and, and your vision. Um, also your floor managers and of course your sales staff, because they're the ones that at the end of it all are going to be executing your plan for you or, or, you know, a major part of executing that plan. So um, that's been, been crucial is kind of getting other people to help you out and rather than just put yourself on an island and say, I'm the buyer, I'm responsible for, for kind of everything. And then once you do have a, a solid plan in place, I think, trusting your plan is big. A lot of people second guess all of the work they've done during the buying season. And uh, when the orders are about to ship, they kind of <laughs> freak out because they haven't done the, the homework and, and gotten everyone else on the team together. So they kind of get a little nervous and start canceling orders. And that's when lots of problems start. So once again, I think it's important to, to have goals, to get a team together, enact your plan, and then enact your exit strategy kind of at the end. And of course, we'll talk a little more in depth about exit strategies and, and planning prior to that exit strategy. Awesome, thanks Adam. So now that we've got kind of a high level overview of some of the topics that we're gonna cover, we'll, we'll dive in and start to talk about what does it take to create this plan? Um, and obviously a big portion of that is gonna start with your historical data analysis. Um, so data has kind of become the new oil is, is a phrase that's out there now, and it's especially important inside of retail. Um, you know, as I mentioned, consumers have gotten a lot smarter in terms of how they shop. They have a tremendous amount of data at their disposal. So you need to be utilizing the data that you have in order to help you make decisions. Um, and then when we're thinking about data, don't think of it as just the numbers from the previous year. So your sales numbers and your inventory numbers, um, while those are important, it's also too important to consider market trends and things that are happening um, in your customer base in terms of how they're buying um, and utilize that as part of your overall data analysis to kind of execute and create this buying strategy. So, Adam, as you sit down and you're getting ready to go through a buying season, which I believe you just finished, talk to me a little bit about the, the type of data you're looking for and how you're using that information to decide, you know, what is your plan going to be for this year? Yeah, um, I want to start with a quote real quick that uh, was brought up. Um, I can't remember who, uh, who, who I should credit with the quote, but it said, um, uh, retail has never changed this fast and it will never change this slow again. Um, and I think that's a really powerful statement. Um, things are changing so quick and so fast. So while historical data is extremely useful when building a plan, like Jimmy alluded to, um, you have to plan for the future. You have to analyze market trends. You have to be able to switch and change on a dime. Um, and, you know, you have to take your historical data and, you know, make sure you analyze it correctly and use it, I guess, you know, to, to be able to change and to kind of alter your trajectory. Um, so, yeah, so that's a great quote. I think it's really uh, a powerful quote to remember. And then, of course, I rambled and I forgot your initial question, Jimmy. So throw that at me one more time. That is quite all right. Um, so what type of data points are you looking at and how are you utilizing them um, to create your plan? Yeah, uh, I always like to start high level. So um, a market share report, so sales analysis, um, looking at the previous uh, season and then the season even before that, looking at turns, ROI, gross profit. That's a great place to start so I can kind of see which way a brand is trending. Um, so as I'm creating an open to buy budget, I can allocate my dollars um, towards a certain brand based on their market share and then based on what my plan is for that brand in the store. Um, a certain brand might only be 12% uh, market share, but um, they're introducing new products into the marketplace. I can feel the customer demand. Um, the people in my marketing team and social media team are really excited about it. They've gotten a lot of great positive feedback from that brand. So 
I may plan that brand to be up a little bit. Um, so sales analysis report, I think, is, is great. And then if you want to go down to, to the next level, uh, take a stock status report and we can take a look at certain styles, footwear styles, see how they're turning, see how they're performing uh, to decide how many, how much of my open to buy budget I'm going to allocate towards a brand and a style. All right. I think that uh, that kind of segues very nicely into the next slide we have here, which is focused on that budgeting and cost. Um, so I think a couple takeaways we have from, you know, focusing on the historical data piece is, you know, focus from a higher level. So starting with your suppliers um, and identify some of those key performance metrics. So ROI, turn, margin were a few that you listed off and then kind of work your way down into some of the specific products that those brands are carrying to help you to help kind of guide you into, um, you know, where are you going to uh, put, you know, invest some money in, in terms of their product. Uh, and then from the, budgeting and cost standpoint, um, again, I think this segue is very nicely because like we said, it's very important to look at your historical data um, and that's a good starting point for planning out what your budget's going to be because you want to be able, you want to carry the amount of, the enough inventory to meet whatever your sales goals are for a particular month during the period that you're going to buy for. So knowing what you sold last year and incorporating your projected growth percentage um, for the time that you're buying for is ultimately going to help you decide what that budget's going to be. Um, and I know that, you know, budgeting and open to buy has been a pretty popular topic for, uh, for us over the past few months and people are really trying to get a, a better understanding of this. Um, you know, we've got a lot of, uh, of our retailers that have some newer buyers and are trying to get familiar with this concept and even some more experienced buyers that just kind of want a refresher or maybe a different way to think about it. So, um, Adam, you started talking about it a little bit, but let's let's get a little more into the weeds in terms of how you're thinking about creating your budget based off of what you're seeing happening in the market, your historical data, and what your goals are moving forward. Yeah, so like I uh, talked about uh, on the previous slide, um, market share, so a sales analysis report showing market share is, is normally where I start. Um, and then I'll take a look at the product assortment from a brand and and decide, okay, am I going to be adding styles? Am I going to be, you know, taking away styles? Am I doubling down on widths? And am I going to, is that um, particular brand going to grow because I'm offering more things for my customer, whether it's uh, shoes that I might market towards um, medical professionals, um, podiatrists, I can take that into account. Um, but I also think it's important to take that, that market share, that what I'm forecasting and share that with, my leadership team um, at the store level to kind of get them on board so they understand, you know, why brand X has a couple more styles this year. Why do we have so many of this shoe or this brand in, in the back room? And I said, well, this is what I'm seeing um, a demand in the marketplace. This brand is going to be focusing on these shoes for their marketing um, initiative for, for this season. So this is something we want to get behind because, you know, the, the digital savvy customer is going to see this all over on social media, on websites. Um, so that's good to, to have there. Um, when I do talk about open to buy, I just want to say I often leave um, a percentage, maybe two percentage points available in my open to buy for kind of last minute additions during the season, whether it be um, an SMU um, special allocations or maybe just a new emerging brand or a new style that's gotten really hot that I might not have been aware of before or maybe didn't take notice of before. And now it's really hot. My sales rep is like, hey, this, this model's killing it in your, in your area or it's been a great seller, surprise seller for us. We didn't forecast it to be this good. And that the worst thing to, 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 to say to yourself is, man, I, I just don't have the money in my open to buy um, to bring in this style that I know will resonate with my, with my customer. So having a little bit put aside each month or each quarter uh, for things like that, I think is, is pretty important. When I start with a, with a budget, I you know, create it for each brand. And then I break down from there uh, gender. Uh, a big mistake I see in some buyers is they start uh, spending money on, on an order for a brand and it ends up being 50-50 you know, gender split. When in, in most cases, at least you know, for Fleet Feet stores, it's you know, a bias towards women so we end up spending just as amount of, the same amount of money on men and women, and then our inventory is 
ends up being upside down because we're the sell through percentage for women is much higher. So making sure you look at gender before you go down to class, neutral, stability, trail, and then you go down to model. So overall, 30,000 foot view, a budget for each brand. Then I look at historical data to figure out uh, gender splits can, so I can allocate my dollars between the two gender, genders percentage wise. And then we go down to class. So we're not spending more money in the stability category when our sales uh, history show that it's prominently neutral or vice versa, depending on your store. And then we'll go down to, to the model style. Great, thanks Adam. Um, I think that was a pretty great summary. So we'll, uh, we'll continue on here. Um, and some of the feedback we get when we talk about these topics is kind of the, the idea of not really having enough time in the store to be able to really dedicate um, to creating this plan and, and doing all the analysis required. Uh, so one of the things we wanted to touch on is finding any way you can to automate some of your processes and uh, eliminate the amount of time it takes you to do certain things. So some of the things we've called out is just having, you know, scheduled or saved reports that you can um, have run and ready for you so that you're not spending the time trying to figure out what reports you need to run and waiting on them to run um, or just having them, you know, uh, delivered to you so that you, as soon as you're ready to sit down and start analyzing the data, you have them for you. Um, and just any other way that you can kind of find for, some efficiencies. Um, Adam, do you have any, any other ways besides uh, reporting that you found that you've been able to kind of shorten the time for this process or at least make it a little bit easier for you given all that you've got going on? I definitely utilize the, the subscription aspect in RICS to set up uh, reports to be emailed to, to myself uh, on a weekly or, or monthly basis. I also um, take the opportunity to, to loop in my sales reps or sales managers and I put them on subscription reports as well so they can see quarterly sales, monthly sales, so they can help uh, keep track of, of my business as well. And I think that will tie in with uh, the end of life. Um, if a brand is aware of um, successes or inventory uh, issues that I'm, that I'm having, they're a little more likely to kind of help me out on the back end um, with an exit strategy or a, a mid-season change where we need to, to make some changes. So. If you're not using the subscriptions uh, in RICS, I really highly encourage the, the subscription um, option there and looping in your sales reps and other even other members of, of your team, um, whether it be your floor leaders or your marketing uh, team, letting them know what's going on sales-wise from a brand level uh, down. If you want to take a quick second, I'm looking at the chat feature and, and Amanda asked uh, a good question. Is there a reason why you choose to run your open to buy by brand and not class. Uh, no, there's no no reason. I often will run it by uh, class as well as a starting point. Um, I just kind of go that that highest level. So whether you want to start by class, whether it be um, you know neutral stability trail, and then go brand, uh, either one is fine. Um, that's just a, a personal preference. I start by brand and work kind of backwards with my best selling uh, brands. But great question. All right, and Adam, throughout the conversation so far, you've talked about you know really making sure you're looping everybody in in the process. And I know I think it would be important here to highlight that one of the most important people in the process is ultimately going to be your customer. And I think uh, you know anyone who's ever been a buyer is guilty of certainly buying things that they like or you know buying for themselves. Um, so kind of talking about the importance of, you know, getting some input in from some of your top customers and really trying to get an idea of what do your customers want to make sure that you're buying inventory that they're going to like and, you know, they're going to ultimately want to come in and purchase. So talk to me a little bit about how this has played a role in kind of uh, your planning process and um, any advice you have on the best way to do this. Yeah, I haven't done this too much, but the, the couple of times we, we have done it here, it's, it's been a, a great success. So um, we have one brand that's, uh, super friendly, energetic, excited, or, or their team. And, um, we've held, uh, a VIP customer night to help us with the line showing. Now I'll still do a separate line showing with the brand, but, um, we'll invite top customers, um, or just key people in our, our community. Um, maybe they're, uh, an influencer in our, our community or, 
They um, are a coach in our training programs or a mentor in our training programs. And we'll invite them in the store after hours for kind of a, a preview, if you will, which is really just kind of a line showing. Um, and I'll have kind of vetted the line beforehand, but we'll give these, these VIP uh, customers kind of a chance to, to help us pick colors. Um, if they're sample size, they get to try a couple things on um, and just give us feedback. Like what are they, you know, what colors do they feel are trending that they like? Um, what are they looking for experience wise? You know, um, things that feedback that they may be giving um, our sales staff, but doesn't always trickle down to, to a buyer or to a floor manager or to someone on, on the marketing team. And I think it also just makes these customers feel special. They, you know, they spend a lot of money in your store and this is a great little way to kind of say thank you and, and, and value their, uh, their input, you know? So maybe you bring in a little bit of wine, some snacks. Um, and then at the end of it, you can, you know, do a discount on a couple hours after the store shopping experience or, or something like that. Also, when I do uh, line showings, um, I try to loop in as many people as I can from the, from our corporate office. Um, people from different age groups, different backgrounds, of course, different genders. Um, you know, uh, I, I think a, a shoe nerd does not always make a great buyer because like Jimmy said, they tend to buy kind of what they like or, or the technical stuff, which, which is great. And we love talking tech with our customers, but a lot of times it comes down to, to not only fit and feel, but just a visual appearance of, of a shoe. You know, um, a lot of our customers, you know, are not serious runners. They are runners that may, you know, put in five, 10 miles a week tops, but then they're, you know, doing all the other stuff. They're doing burn, they're doing orange theory, they're doing boot camps. They're just wearing the shoes casually and they don't consider themselves a runner, but they might want to wear it to the gym and then run the mile home from the gym. Um, so I think getting as many people to help you with that decision of, um, you know, input from what you're carrying is, is great. And I think you made a good point there, Adam, about kind of making the customer feel special because what we see in you know retail now is that despite the explosive growth of e-commerce over the last few years, um, customers still really want that personalized experience. And if they feel like they're you know included in that buying process and in how you're considering products for them, um, you're definitely going to increase the likelihood that you know they feel valued and they're going to come and continue to shop with you because uh, they know they're getting a truly personalized experience there. So one of the, uh, the other people or groups that you've mentioned as we've gone through this is talking about um, your vendors. Um, and this has always been a, this has been a pretty big topic over the last several years instead of buying, especially when it comes to sharing data with your vendors. Um, so one of the things that I've observed in the industry over the last few years is that the, the brand focus and the brand mentality has shifted pretty drastically. Um, gone are the days where reps are just trying to make sure there's no holes in your inventory. Um, and now the brands are dedicating a lot of time and resources on educating the reps on how to understand data and really how to understand the businesses that they're going into. Um, so they can make smart decisions, recommend the right inventory, move them out of things that are not working um, and ultimately help them be successful so that that brand can be successful inside of their store and overall. Um, so, Adam, for you, obviously, you've been a buyer for a long time. So talk to me a little. Let's talk a little bit about how you saw, you know, your relationship with the brands, you know, several years ago compared to now. And then what types of interactions you have with them, whether that's line showings during sell-in um, or just throughout the process as you're analyzing whether or not your plan is working. I remember uh, when I first got into the industry, um, you know, kind of fresh and I would have a sales rep come in and show me the line and they would do what's called the bag dump or what I call the bag dump. They'd come in, show you every single shoe from every aspect of their line, just dump out their sales bag and then leave. Um, and that's the way the line showings used to go. And then I was left by myself to kind of figure out, you know, after my head stopped spinning, like what just happened there? Try to try to figure out um, the direction for, for my store, for the, all the stores that I, that I buy for. Um, so now what I, what I try to do after I set up an appointment with the vendor to see a line, I will kind of forecast to them, here's my, here's your market share. Here's what styles sold well the previous season. Here's what we struggled with. 
And hopefully they know this information already because I've been keeping them up to date uh, with monthly sales reports anyway. So when they come to the line showing, usually the first question they ask is, hey, how's business? They should know how my business is because I've been communicating this to them frequently. And before this line showing, um, or right when the appointment was made, I sent them you know, a quick email with, here's your market share. Like I said, here's what's selling well, here's what's struggling for us. Here's the type of products I want to see. You know, um, I don't want to see anything in your training line unless it's the latest, hottest thing that your brand is going to be marketing. Keep that in your bag. Not really interested in that. Let's focus on the products that I know uh, are going to sell. And I often will give them a budget for the quarter or for the season. Like, based on your market share and my sales and my open to buy, here's what I have to spend on your brand. Help me create an order for the season. And I kind of put that on the vendors a little bit because then that makes them choose, you know, what styles they're going to put in the door. If I have X amount of dollars to spend, here's what, um, you know, help me decide what are the best products to spend. And that way they, you know, are kind of tied in a little bit and they're not going to be pushing every single shoe on you because you're like, Oh, this is my budget. You're helping me create it. Um, and that helps with, with, uh, I think buy in later on end of life where these brands can say, okay, I'm a little bit responsible for this shoe. I, I told Adam to bring in this, uh, the shoe, um, based on his, his budget, what he had left over. It's not really working great. You know, I feel a little bit responsible. Let's switch gears. Let's get out of that shoe and, and, and try something, something different there. Um, and then last thing also with these line showings, um, I try to loop in, um, usually my marketing person, um, a floor manager, and even my apparel buyer during these line showings. And it's not for the whole line showing. Maybe it's the last 15 minutes, a quick little recap of, hey, guys, this is kind of the assortment that I'm considering that the rep and I have kind of talked about. Um, from a marketing aspect, I'll have my marketing manager sit down with the sales rep for the last 15 minutes and start making a very brief outline of a plan for either the upcoming season or the current season that you're into. Um, putting dates on the calendar for events, for demos, for clinics, for whatever. It doesn't have to be in detail of, of what's gonna happen, but start putting dates on the calendar and getting that rep involved more uh, in your business, I think is, is super important. Once again, we wanna eliminate the rep coming in, doing a bag dump, and then uh, leaving your store and uh, without any real plan or action. Awesome. Uh, so some of the other things that we've highlighted throughout here um, is just kind of the focus on the technology piece and making sure you're investing in the right technology. You know, we've talked a lot about uh, sharing the data that you have with your brands and reviewing your data. So ensuring that you, know, you have the right technology to give you the data that you need um, and also utilizing that to help you create your purchase orders. Um, so you have a record of what you bought, you know what needs to be received, um, and everything kind of reconciles out evenly in the long run. So that'll roll us into kind of the, the piece of executing your plan. And Adam, you, you touched on this a little bit earlier where, you know, a lot of people will get cold feet once it comes time for some of those future orders to start rolling in. And, um, you know, too often what we hear from the vendors is uh, somebody will write great futures and then they end up canceling a good chunk of them only to reorder the exact same product on an at-once order, um, you know, losing out on some of the, the bigger discounts they would have gotten and also making it much more difficult for the brand to plan um, you know, their inventory to make sure that you have enough stock of kind of their top selling products. Um, so the, the one th other thing I'll call out here is, you know, the, the plan is not kind of one and done. It, it's going to be evolving as you go through. It's really meant to kind of help guide you through the beginning of the season. And then you make adjustments as things uh, change over the course of the season. So something may do very well or, you know, better than expected or something may do worse than you expected. Um, and you just have to be able to adapt to that. So, Adam, anything that you want to add to this one as well from your experience? Yeah, I think it is sometimes nerve wracking where you, you sit down and, and you write these large, potentially large future orders and then time comes to ship and you're looking at the units and you're doing the math and you're like, wow, this is going to be a large order with a pretty large invoice attached to it. Um, I just think it's, 
it's really important if you are uh, planning out your business, if you are getting buy-in from your sales staff, from your marketing team, and from your sales rep, um, they should really try to, to trust your future orders. Um, it just kind of throws off your plan if you are you know, canceling orders left and right. It would be the same if you were a, a sports coach and you know, your plan is for your relief pitcher to come in in the eighth inning. And uh, unfortunately, your starter only went three innings. And now your plan is is in trouble and you have to get through those middle innings before you can get your stronger, you know, closers or relief pitchers in there. So, you know, sometimes you do have to kind of make an adjustment on the, on the fly or because a product isn't resonating in the marketplace like you would plan. Um, but we all have our best selling models. And if we, if we trust the futures that we placed and the plan that we have in place, uh, you shouldn't uh, hopefully aren't wasting too much time in the back room uh, revising those orders or just combing over these orders all the time. Not saying it's easy, but uh, I think if you do the work on the front end, you should be able to trust your orders that you've written. Now, one of the things you called out there, Adam, was the idea of an exit strategy. Um, and I can say again from the, the recent conferences that I've been to, this is an incredibly important part of the plan that is being emphasized by a lot of retailers uh, because so many people just seem to struggle with the idea of it. And it's both from the standpoint of what do you do if something you brought in isn't doing as well as you would have expected. Um, and then also from the end of life standpoint. So um, you have a model that's about to update and how are you planning to get as much of that old inventory out as possible to make way for the new inventory. So, one of the things I'll call out is we, you know, what we see is we tend to see a lot of people, they buy a hundred to sell 20 of that end of life model um, over the last month that the shoe is going to be available. And they end up finding themselves stuck with a lot of inventory that they're going to have to sell at a drastically reduced margin. I've seen instances where, you know, an old model takes an additional 11 months to sell through the rest of the inventory. So almost you know, the full selling cycle of the, the next model and it's sold for, you know, about 20 to a 22% margin. Uh, so I think it's incredibly important to focus on this part of your plan, um, whether that's when things aren't working or whether then it's uh, an end of life. So you're not stuck with more inventory than you know what to do with. Um, so Adam, I know that you've got a lot of opinions on this. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm very interested to hear about kind of what your approach is uh, from the exit strategy standpoint. Yeah, for sure. This is definitely a hot topic. And I think this is one of the most important aspects of, of a buying plan is having a, an exit strategy. And when we get to the kind of question, the Q and a part after this, I'd you know love to hear from some other retailers uh, what their exit strategy is. And, you know, maybe we can share some, some tips across everyone. Cause I think this is, you know, super important to your business. No one wants to mark down product and, and lose money. Um, so go back to kind of the planning part of it. Um, this is where I think it's really important once again, to keep your sales reps and your sales managers looped in throughout the season on sell through and how things are going. Um, I buy for a very large number of stores and I set up, um, model stocks with my sales reps and I have a lot of my sales reps manage the inventory for me, just filling in based on these model stocks. This gives them the opportunity to once again see what's moving and what's not. And we can decide at an earlier uh, time frame to kind of turn off the faucet um, for a certain model before it's updating. Um, I tend to, to not future a product um, 60 days, sometimes 75 days before it's updating, just to give myself, uh, our, my stores a chance to sell through that product. And also, as, as you guys know now, um, I think gone are the days where a product lives for 12 months in your store. We see it all the time now where products are releasing earlier than the brands have forecasted, mostly because it's either selling really, really well and the brand itself is out of inventory in the previous model. So they'll push up the new model or the fit and feel was, was so poor in that model that they want to get it out of the marketplace as soon as possible. And then we're stuck, the retailers stuck with that product. Um, so Forecasting, keeping the vendors uh, informed about what the status is of your inventory will really help with, with that exit strategy. 
Um, I also forecast during the line showing when I'm talking to, to a rep that, hey, maybe this product that uh, this new shoe, my plan for this product is to bring it in for a quarter, right? I'm going to bring it in during back to school or back, uh, bring it in during my um, peak of my training programs. We're going to market that shoe with the goal to, to sell out within a quarter and be done with that shoe. You know, we don't need to be married to a product for its full life cycle. Um, I like kind of dropping product in and out and playing with not only colors, but a certain model for back to school, for cross country, for uh, training program season. Then when it does come down to uh, kind of end of life and we're winding down to, to a product, there's a couple of things uh, you know, that I like to do. Um, sometimes within a store, I'll just do a small little pull contest if we're over inventoried on a product. You can also perk uh, your staff a couple dollars to, to sell a shoe um, that's about to update. I have my stores just you know, place some kind of a, like a yellow dot on these shoes and that should signify my staff that if you're pulling um, you know, something in the same category, pull this shoe because we need to move through it. And then we can change that you know, color dot to you know, green dot. That means the staff gets, gets perked on it. But, um, you know, I'll walk some of the sales floor during uh, business hours and make sure that, you know, staff are pulling these dotted shoes that we do see them on the floor. So we are trying to, to move through that product. You can also reach out to the rep, uh, you know, of course, to, to do swaps, product swaps. Just as long as that's done, you know, 60 to 90 days before a shoe is updated. Um, my history, I found that the, the, the brands are are pretty open to moving out of a uh, product if it's not selling. But if you're waiting to 30 days, 15 days before a shoe updates or even after it updates, you're gonna be a lot harder because that vendor has to discount it and sell that shoe somewhere as well. And the worst thing can happen is, uh, you know, uh, the shoe that you just was in your back room is now down the street at, you know, uh, a discounter and now it's selling for, you know, a discounted price and it just kind of, saturates the market price with discounted product. Um, so that's kind of tough there. But yeah, lot, lots of thoughts on exit strategies, but I think planning ahead and knowing when to kind of turn off that faucet as early as possible, uh, following uh, map policies and being able to, to know when you're allowed to advertise a shoe for a discounted price is, is important as well. That's unfortunately pretty hard to keep track of at times because it's ever changing and there's Every vendor has a different, you know, policy on on advertising uh, discounted products. All right, thanks, Adam. So we obviously covered a lot of material today. So I'm just going to kind of try and give a brief overview of everything. Um, so I'd say the big kind of takeaway points we have from today are data and communication. Um, we talked about utilizing both your historical data and your projected sales for a buying period to help you develop your open to buy plan. And Adam described a couple ways to do that. Uh, and also how to account, account for some of that variable change inside of your plan by um, allowing a, a few extra percentage points for you know, the unexpected, uh, whether that be a new product or, or something that didn't work very well. Um, but really having that plan ready to go by the time you're, you're ready to sit down with your vendors and talk selling. Um, and then also making sure your vendors are ready to come in and talk. Um, and as Adam said, not you know, dump everything that's in the bag and um, spend a bulk of the time just showing you every SKU that they have available, but really focusing on the things that are going to matter to your business um, and keeping a constant open communication with your vendors so that they're up to speed on what's happening in your business. They know what's working, what's not working, and they can help you make adjustments to your plan uh, as the season goes on. Taking advantage of the technology at your disposal to, you know, be able to view all of the data that you'd want to see in order to help you generate this plan and make decisions. Um, and then of course, uh, creating um, an exit strategy inside of your plan is uh, kind of become a crucial point to make sure that, you're going to be out of old product by the time new product is ready um, and you're not hanging on to anything just in case that one person comes in uh, to pick it up. Um, Adam, is there anything else that you want to add to, to summarize our conversation today? No, not in particular. I just, uh, just want to iterate, reiterate the, the, the planning aspect and, and bringing in as many people as you can, getting yourself off that lonely island. Um, it's not you. It's, it's a team of people that, help you create and execute your plan. Um, 
it's always tough when uh, the sales staff opens up a box of shoes and they have no idea what the shoe is. They have no idea it's coming in. I want the staff to to open up a shoe or walk the, the back of the shelves and, and see a product like, sweet, I've been waiting for the shoe. I've heard so much about it. I knew it was coming. I can't wait to pull it and, you know, get my customer excited about the newest, latest and greatest thing. All right, thank you, gentlemen. We um, are running a little close on time, but I think we, um, we do still have a few minutes. If you would like to ask any questions, please feel free to type those into the Zoom webinar chat or Q&A panel right now. Um, it looks like we already have another question. Um, this one comes from Kim, and I believe this may be directed at Adam, but Jimmy, please feel free to chime in, of course. Um, Kim asks about reporting for budgets and how specifically you actually determine what your budget will be for a brand. I'm uh, fortunate enough um, to have some amazing uh, accountants and numbers people here at Fleet Feet and one of the accountants created a, an amazing tool that's a little bit above my uh, understanding and knowledge level of, of Excel and finance um, that takes uh, sales, an average rolling sales for a quarter um, and factors in cost of goods and kind of creates a, a monthly budget by dollars, which I can then break out by class. So I may have a you know $100,000 budget for the month of March. I know that my footwear sales are 60% of my store. So we're going to take $60,000 towards footwear. And then from there, I'll run a sales analysis report to show market share for footwear. And then I can break it down. So for the month of March, um, I'll have X amount of dollars. If we'll say, you know, brand X is 20% of my market share, they're going to get 20% of that open to buy for the month. And then from there, I'll take whatever that dollar figure is. And if 70% um, of my orders are futures, they'll get 70% of that right away. And then the other 30% could be fill-ins throughout the month. So I kind of portion it out uh, that way. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, it looks like no other questions have come in since, but for those still on with us, if you do have any additional questions, please feel free to reach out. We are here and happy to help answer those questions even after the event. And to that final point, um, after this, shortly after this webinar here today, we will make the webinar recording available um, for on-demand viewing. So make sure to check that out on our website. And it looks like we had one question actually just come in and it's a quick one so we can take. Adam, can you repeat the quote that you mentioned earlier? Yeah, let me see if I can get it exactly right. Um, I believe it was retail has never moved this fast before and it will never move this slow again. Awesome. Perfect. Well, thank you, gentlemen, both so much for joining us today. A lot of great info shared. And um, for those of you that um, would like to share this great info with your colleagues and friends and peers in the industry, you can share that on-demand webinar recording that will be made available here shortly. Thank you for your time, and everyone have a great day. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Adam.